years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3, coming up this afternoon. Rishi Sunak's policy of sending migrants to Rwanda faces further delays as Labour vowed to oppose the plans in a crucial vote tomorrow. They claim each deportation will cost as much as sending six people into space. Meanwhile, Princess Kate has been seen on video for the first time this year, but it's still not enough to satisfy the royal conspiracy theorists. And is it double O heaven for James Bond fans as Aaron Taylor Johnson looks set to be the latest on screen incarnation of Ian Fleming's hero? All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Elliot Gottkine. Good afternoon. The controversial Rwanda bill has suffered another setback after MPs rejected the House of Lords changes to the policy. All 10 amendments, which included allowing courts to question Rwanda's safety, were overturned. It comes after the government insisted the country is safe, despite the Supreme Court previously ruling it is not. Former Home Office adviser Claire Pearsall told Talk TV uh, there has been unnecessary pushback from the government. The problem is with this is when you've got a bill which potentially breached international law, that is exactly what the House of Lords are there to do, is to scrutinise it. And I'm sure that we would all want to have our human rights upheld if that uh, applied to ourselves. So it's right that they look at it. And some of the amendments were quite sensible. Israel has agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss its planned Rafah operation after the US president warned that going ahead with it would be a mistake. Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone on Monday as tensions between the two countries grow over the war in Gaza. It comes after the White House said Israel had killed Hamas's third most senior leader in an attack on an underground compound last week. The first person in England to be convicted of cyber flashing has been jailed. Registered sex offender Nicholas Hawkes from Essex sent unsolicited nude pictures to a 15-year-old girl and a woman. The woman took screenshots of the WhatsApp image and sent them to the police. Cyber flashing became an offence in England at the end of January. Hawkes has been sentenced to 16 months in prison. A new report out today is warning that roads in England and Wales are at breaking point with pothole repairs at an eight-year high. The annual alarm survey found that local councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's a 43% jump from last year. Mechanic Louise Baker knows firsthand the problems that they cause. I, I book up like four weeks in advance for just services and MOTs, and in that time I get at least four phone calls a week saying about, um, I found this piece of metal hanging off my car, I hit a big bump, my tire's blown out, my 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 tire's not holding pressure. Yeah, it's, it's constant. Meanwhile, a new poll has found just 3% of dentists believe the government's plans to fix the industry will result in them seeing more NHS patients. In a survey of more than 1,000 practices across England, 9 in 10 said the proposals to inject £200 million into services are not sufficiently ambitious to meet the scale of the challenge facing NHS dentistry. Darren Jones, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, says many are going abroad as a result. One of the reasons that clinicians are leaving the country um, is because there's been such a lack of investment and support for the workforce in the NHS. We've seen the strikes, we've seen the working conditions. And understandably, especially if you're younger and trying to save up for a deposit or whatever your priorities are, if you're being offered more money and a nicer quality of life for a couple of years in Australia, and you're free and single, why wouldn't you go? And finally, there's fresh speculation over who could be the next James Bond. The Sun is reporting that kick-ass and Marvel Films actor Aaron Taylor-Johnson has been formally offered the role, which was last played by Daniel Craig. The next Bond film will be the 26th, following No Time to Die. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, plenty of fine and dry weather out there for this afternoon and it's still feeling mild as well, but it's not bone dry. As you can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture, we have seen some showers passing through eastwards, but they are mostly tending to disappear across parts of Scotland. However, over areas of the Midlands, the West Country and some eastern parts of England, there may be some heavy and thundery showers this afternoon. And before the day is out, there will be rain arriving across parts of Devon and Cornwall. But as I said, it's mild for the time of year. Temperatures a little above average, up to 50 or 16 degrees Celsius. Overnight, that rain across Devon and Cornwall will steadily move its way north and eastwards. Another pulse of rain also across Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, there will be some heavy downpours across parts of England and Wales, particularly across the high ground of Wales and later in the night over areas of the Pennines. There will also be some showery rain for eastern parts of Scotland. So pretty wet, but there will be dry conditions in the far southwest and the far northwest as well. Now, through tomorrow, that rain continues across parts of Northern England, the northwest of Wales, eastern parts of Scotland as well. Still some heavy downpours likely, but it does ease through the day. Either side of that, it will be mostly fine and dry with sunshine in the north where it will be cool but mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including the latest wrangles over the Rwanda bill. And we'll be looking at the latest controversy for the BBC, as it's said to be working on proposals to introduce advertising on its podcasts and on-demand radio shows when they are streamed on third-party services such as Spotify. Is that a case of having your cake and eating it. And today uh, we're joined in the studio by Daily Express political editor Sam Lister. Thanks for coming along for the ride, Sam. Uh, we've got lots to get through today, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the BBC. Uh, uh, this is very early days, but this is the first time in the history of our state broadcaster paid for by us hapless TV licence fee payers. Uh, 3.5 billion quid a year they get from us. And still they say they haven't got enough money. What? Uh, so they want to get some more money by taking adverts on podcasts and for on-demand radio shows that are uh, broadcast on different media, as uh, Alex just said, like Spotify. But this is swiftly, they say, going to move on to programmes like The Archers and uh, Desert Island Discs, big channel, uh, channel four, radio four programmes. Uh, so this looks like the thin end of the wedge. If they start to rake in money, if they start to take adverts for The Archers and uh, Desert Island Discs, both big programmes, then they're starting to live on commercial re uh, uh, revenue. Uh, why should we have to pay for them as well? They can't have both, right? Well, I think this is this is clearly the BBC coming to the realisation that everybody else has, that the licence fee is not sustainable. Uh, the charter renewal, I think, is due in uh, two or three years' time. 27. Yeah, 27. and so I think that the Conservative government made it clear that they are looking at this very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how Labour feel about this. We, we're yet to hear their views on this, but I suspect they are more pro-licence fee. Yeah. Um, but, but the reality is young people do not watch... Mm traditional TV and the, the licence fee, there is a huge question mark over it. I mean, I think it's important to point out the BBC have been making money commercially for a very long time, in fact. They sell rights to big programmes abroad. If you watch BBC content in another country, if you read BBC online in a different country, they allow advertising in that space. Yes. So this has actually been going on a long time and this is about putting advertising on an international platform where someone in Jamaica could be listening to The Archers on Spotify because you can't log into BBC mm -hmm. iPlayer from abroad, it's, uh, that's protected, and you could try getting around with a VPN. So actually, this has been going on a long time. It's just an expansion of that, and arguably one could say that this sort of funds the transition to cutting the licence fee. It actually enables that future goal, if that is what you want to see happen. I say to the BBC, drown yourself in commercials. Have as many adverts as you like. Pack the entire network with adverts and pay for yourself. And then you will find, and this is going to be a real culture shock for you people who work at the state broadcaster, you'll have to make 
create programs that people actually want to watch, which is a completely alien concept to all of you, I know, uh, because if you make programs that people don't want to watch, you won't get any advertising revenue. Uh, so pay for yourself, make programs what people want to see, and stop charging us the grotesque fee of £170 a year, uh, even to watch uh, channels that are not the BBC. This licence fee system is the most absurd anachronism of this country, and we've got to get rid of it. That's my thought. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone want to get involved? I mean, I, like I said, I've always been far more sanguine about this because, uh, I mean, look, if the BBC operated as it should operate and if it did act like an impartial organisation, not one that's recently had to be uh, attacked by Richard Tice's lawyers and forced into a grovelling apology for calling uh, Reform UK, the political party, far right, uh, which is clearly uh, libelous um, should have been and extreme, slander. Right, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, if they actually acted as an impartial broadcaster, and as you said, made economical programmes and, and programmes of public interest rather than just paying Gary Lineker and people to swan about in tutus on that horrible Saturday night show, mm -hmm. then I would actually be the first to defend the licence fee and defend having uh, platforms without advertising because that actually aids impartiality. But you can't have it both ways. I you just can't want, I just of, want you know, to get, let, I, let go of being the sure, bastion sure. of impartiality. I want to get to the point where it's none of my business what the BBC does. It can do what it likes. It can be impartial. It can carry on its absurd pro Palestine reporting. And I won't have any say in the matter because it's an independent broadcaster making its own money and it can do what it likes. Right now, it can't or it shouldn't be able to because I'm paying for it and yet it does behave like that, which is an outrage. I, I think that the thing is, the, the point of the BBC and the reason why we pay a licence fee is that it's there to do the things that commercial organisations cannot do. Mm. Yet the things it cuts when it's short of money are those very things. Exactly. So local radio, which actually yeah. really is important to people. Oh. Uh, they find out what's going on in their area, they've got a connection with it, a relationship with it, a lot of older people who are um, mainly kind of housebound, don't mm -hmm, get out so mm -hmm. much, have those really close relationships with those local radio stations. Yeah. That's all been really dramatically cut. And, and of that's course what the, the BBC news channel. should be doing. It. UK yeah, Rolling news, news gone, merged yeah. with the BBC yeah. World. I wish they'd pay less money to rubbish on television, yeah. some of their rubbish dramas and rubbish reality shows and rubbish dancing things, and actually said, let's keep some sporting events yeah. so the whole nation can exactly. enjoy them together. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, no, these are, these are important arguments. Yes. Are that. you referred to Strictly Come Dancing I as hate rubbish? That. <laughs> How dare thing. you? How dare oh, you? Oh, gosh. It's most God. Of, that, is a, that is an example of a three-hour a nauseating load of drivel that could be done in half an hour with people that people actually know. I've got a better... Uh, you could do it in no time at all by yeah, not exactly. running it. Get God, rid of that. I, I hate that come programme. Dancing. But I arguably, this is the whole point. Argu if you look at the BBC remit, arguably, they shouldn't be spending any money on uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah. They should be spending money on local broadcasting, yeah. Yeah. the Sport, BBC, news, yeah. orchestra, yeah. that kind of yeah, thing. Absolutely. Retaining yeah. the rights to the big sports events because yes, yeah. they've lost all of that yeah. and so on and so forth. Uh, so we are... are Asking you today, our wonderful audience, if the BBC starts making money from adverts, why should we pay for it? Pretty straightforward question. <laughs> Give us a call on 03444991. How much does that cost of yours? Is that free, by the way? Uh, that that, call? Uh, I think well, you might have yeah, to pay say, for it. Yeah. Standard network uh, rate and something yeah, else, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, I'm going to say it's Pays free. Pays Kev's salary it's anyway. Not like, put it this way: it's not 170 <laughs> quid a year. 03444991000, or you can text us. So write talk in the, uh, at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222, uh, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Thank you, Alex. Right, to our top story now. And the government has held firm in its standoff with the House of Lords as MPs last night rejected 10 amendments made by peers to the Rwanda deportation bill. And the stalemate is not expected to break soon. The bill will now return to the Lords on Wednesday, where it's expected Labour peers will try to restore their proposed changes, which aim to water down the legislation. Labour has also vowed to oppose the government's plans in Wednesday's vote, claiming each deportation will cost as much as sending six people to space. But we don't want to do that, do we? Well, uh, send so to what? Space. <laughs> so what? I think you probably send do. Send them to space. That's not a bad idea, <laughs> yeah, actually. The Next moon step. scheme. <laughs> uh, the delays mean the bill may not become law until after the Easter break, threatening Sunak's hopes of getting flights off the ground before June.
Well, joining us now is Chairman of Brexit Watch and co-deputy leader of Reform UK, Ben Habib. I haven't had Chairman of Brexit Watch for a long time. Is that, that still extant? I'm not that, sure I'm still Chairman sort of, of Brexit Watch. I don't Watch. think, well, if you're not sure, I don't think you are I'm either. I to be. Those were the good old days when you were always the good old days. Well, we still had hope. You can be Chair of Rwanda Watch instead. You can sort of, you know, turn, turn it into something else. I mean, you know, this is what the Lords do. They chew something apart. Anything that is sensible and potentially, you know, democratic and something the general public public wants, as soon as it enters the upper chamber, it gets mauled, it goes back to the government, the government say, not listening, goes back to the upper chamber, and yeah. things just get bogged down in this system. I mean, a flight is not taking off in May, is it? No, it isn't. And I suspect Rishi Sunak secretly is quite pleased with all of that, because this is what I would call performative legislation. There's a lot of <laughs> hullabaloo about what's going on. We're going to sort out the illegal migrant crossings. This legislation is going to do it. We were told the Nationality and Borders Bill, do you remember that, under Brie Patel? That would do it. It didn't do it. We were then told the Illegal Migration Act would give us all the authority we needed to deal with Rwanda. That didn't do it. But now we need this new thing. So this is great performance for Rishi. He doesn't actually need to achieve anything. He can just signal to the world that it's not me. I'm doing my level best, but it's the Labour Party and it's the Lords. And this performative legislative process gets the government off the hook, when actually they already possess all the authority they need under international and domestic law, outside of the confines of the European Convention of, the human, of human Rights, to stop the boats before they enter our water, or as explain, they see. Explain that, because, you know, I think this is something that every single time is raised to politicians. They say, we can't do this, it will break international law, it's not feasible, you know, lives may be lost. And everyone's saying, no, physically, this is your border. Surely you can just say, the boat's not crossing this point, so we're sending it back to France. So explain that. What well, about you, our reputation but, uh, on the international stage? Aren't you worried about that? I, I honestly, <laughs> sleepless nights, Kevin. Why do you I think I'm so haggard phrase. in the morning? Yeah. Well, I mean, the minute... Those who would do down this country wish to stymie something, they invoke international law yeah, or our point. reputation on the international stage. But, Alex, I don't need to explain it any better or more in more detail than you did. It is an absolutely fundamental right of being an independent sovereign nation. In international that, law. In international <laughs> law, that you can protect your borders, that you can enforce... There's a reason why border force is called border force, because they're meant to use force at the border. It wasn't that the name was by accident. You know, there's, a, there's thinking behind the name border force. And, but if you want the precise um, international bit of legislation, it's Article 33 of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which says you are entitled as a sovereign nation to take preventative action against someone seeking to enter your territorial waters illegally. It's specific. And that preventative action, it would be entirely reasonable to have a well-trained uh, and armed force in the channel requiring these boats to go back to where they came from. And the great benefit we have is that the channel is 25 miles long and um, the midpoint is the midpoint between France and the United Kingdom, which is 12 and a half miles. And if these boats have made it to the 12 and a half mile mark with enough fuel to do 25 miles, they can turn around and go back. It's no imposition on them. Absolutely. Uh, what, what do the people of this great country make of uh, the parliamentary ping pong that's going on now? So the uh, Rwanda bill is passed by the Commons. It goes up to the House of Lords, who are mostly unelected Lib Dems. Uh, and uh, they say, oh, we don't like this. So there's ten amendments. Uh, you've got to get rid of this. And what, one of the big amendments, of course, is that Parliament's got no right to vote on whether or not Rwanda is safe, which undermines the whole premise of this yeah. uh, entire process. So it goes back to uh, uh, the Commons, whereupon they restore the ten amendments that uh, the Lords has have taken off. It will then go <laughs> back to the Lords, where they'll put them back. I mean, what are we supposed to make of this ludicrous process? Well, I think the average person in the United Kingdom is no different, I suspect, to any of us in this room. They're holding their heads in their hands, wondering what the hell's wrong with this country? Have we lost the political will and ability simply to maintain our territorial integrity? What is the government's first obligation? It is to protect that which is part of the realm. I know using the word realm will also upset lots of people on the far left. But you know what I'm saying. That is their primary obligation, and they seem unable to do it. Um, and, you know, as for the Rwanda 
thing itself. I mean, it's never going to work, is it? We all know <laughs> yeah, it. Well, there work. is that. You know? Underpinning this. <laughs> Underpinning all of this. It's, it's the fact <laughs> it's a total mess. Let's talk about that. Uh, I think that uh, Suna, I get your point. In some ways, he wants to keep kicking the can down the road. But in other ways, uh, I think he's become possessed of a kind of uh, uh, deranged neurosis about Rwanda. If he can just get one plane, plane off. off the ground, he'll win his thousand quid yeah. bet, a hundred quid bet with uh, Piers Morgan. But more to the point, he thinks if he goes to the polls and say, I got, I got a migrant to a Skigali, we'll all go, well, I changed my mind, I'll vote for you yeah. now. I mean, and he, you know they're paying the migrants three thousand pounds grand yeah. a head it's, to go there. But it, I mean. <laughs> but it gets madder and madder. I mean, do you think, Ben, uh, you know, in the fullness of time, uh, because of his deranged uh, syndrome, that he will get at least one migrant, maybe, to Rwanda? I mean, I, I would regret it, because the cost probably will be equivalent to getting someone into yeah. space. Yeah. And we, as the taxpayer, are going to be, you know, trounced again. Um, Surely the big issue here, actually, is there's enough evidence out there from our intelligence and reports around the world looking at what's happening uh, in America on their southern border with Central America, with scheduled flights taking off, which people traffickers are loading African migrants on from Istanbul to Nicaragua. We know that Russia's Wagner mercenaries are deliberately destabilizing regimes, working with people trafficking to flood Europe and the West with migrants as an act of warfare. We know this. We've seen the scenes. We've got the intelligence. So why on earth is this government not taking what's happening in the channel as an actual security threat? They absolutely should be. And as you, as you rightly say, there is ample evidence that the Wagner Group and other um, Russian agencies have been behind this. And we, knew, we know this very clearly as members of the public without access to secret documents because Belarus a couple of years ago was actually flying in people, marching them to the border with Poland and you know, trying to push them into Polish territory. But the Polish did what we should be doing. They put right. up a metal fence and they put yeah. their army and behind more it. more recently, Finland's had to do the same for the exact same reason. So yeah. I don't understand why, just because we don't have a land border, we're suddenly going, oh, well, not a security threat. But, no. but you're right. You know, there, there, there is, there is um, malign foreign interference in this, and we need to recognise the threat which we're facing in this country. If we are borderless, which is what it's getting to the point of, in the US... The United Kingdom and across Western Europe. If we're borderless, we're without defence. And we are taking people in of whom we know nothing. And the notion that these are all genuine refugees and we should welcome them with open arms is a fundamentally flawed notion. It's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, why doesn't Rishi understand? You know, he's in a lot of electoral trouble, uh, as is clear. You know, as he careers towards the next election, shall we say it'll be uh, towards the end of October. Uh, you know, he's facing what uh, Barack Obama called a serious shellacking. Uh, and, uh, Is that what he said yesterday on that little... No, like, no, he, 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 said, that, he said that about uh, Trump, wasn't it? An extinction but, event. Yeah, <laughs> an extinction... But, but, but if he turned the boats around, if he went into the channel and started turning the boats around, uh, that would be a serious vote winner. People would start saying maybe there is something to this Might guy. Turn their fortunes and, yet, and yet he sits there droning on about our Kevin, reputation he... on the international stage. Why doesn't he just do this? Sunak could destroy Reform UK overnight. All he needs to do is cut taxes on the working and middle class, cut taxes on business, slash legal migration, ditch diversity, equality and inclusion, and stop the boats. And that's the end of Reform UK and the Conservatives will win a thumping majority. And I know, and we all know, that they will win a thumping majority because it was largely on those promises that Boris Johnson got his 80-seat majority yeah. in 2019. Small, this country is, by and large, small-c Conservative. They want the country put first, they want private enterprise liberated, and they want the working and middle classes to have aspiration and the ability to you know, move across social stratas. And the policies that I just outlined provide all of that, but they won't do it. Instead, they navel gaze and talk about making the esteemed sword carrier at the coronation the next prime minister, as if that's going to save the government. You know, that really is... <laughs> You know, the sword, the sword carrier who thinks that trans women are women. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We were playing yeah. that. Trans women are women. No, Penny, uh, they're not. And actually, I think technically, uh, Sam, uh, 
you'll know about this, a political editor of the Daily Express and all that. Uh, she could be done there because you're not allowed to lie, are you, in the House of Commons? She stood up and told all the MPs that trans women are women. That's a lie. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure anybody would manage to prosecute that, but... I would. <laughs> I'd give it a good go. <laughs> but I think the fact that it is there as a clip does undermine her leadership She's finished ambitions. for that reason. Right. Alone. And yeah. Don't forget, she wrote that book as well about yes. how the Tories yeah, have yeah. to be much more woke. She thought that was a good platform to uh, sort of uh, promote her career at the time. She made a big mistake. I just yeah. think with the Conservatives thinking, let's swap out the leader again, that'll do the trick. I mean, that's just... Because it's worked every time. Every time. <laughs> it's been a great success. <laughs> Sam, again, drawing on your parliamentary expertise, how long will this ping-pong take? When might the government be in a position to implement whatever the hell it is they want to implement? Well, it's very interesting because you can't get a straight answer, unsurprisingly, <laughs> out of number 10 as to how long they're expecting this to take. And it's usually it can go, like, two rounds, back and forth, back and forth, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the kind of traditional end of it. It could spill over beyond the Easter recess, which that means it's another month in the making. Mm -hmm. I've been told that, actually, Labour will fold on it because they don't want to be the ones who are seen to block it. They want the fight to be taken to the courts okay. so that actually that's they, that's will, they will eventually fold in the Lords. So I think we, there is a, a, a quite a strong chance, I think, that it will get through tomorrow. But they want it to go back to the courts again. Labour How does, much yeah. money Labor are the does. lawyers getting in 2024 yeah. on everything? And yeah. you have to ask, everything. what is the yeah. point of Parliament? Yeah, if it right. isn't Indeed. the supreme legislative yeah. body. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, let's you know. not make you know any that, laws ben? or yeah, proposals or amend is... laws. Let's just leave it yeah. to lawyers to make money. <laughs> it's the, point, the point of Parliament is to allow long-winded lawyers to talk <laughs> at great length about issues that don't interest anyone else. Yeah. Uh, I think that with these debates, particularly yeah. on uh, the Rwanda scheme, these contentious issues, there should be two sort of areas in uh, the House of Commons. One for the verbose lawyers to rabbit on about, like, kind of Jones yeah. versus Smith, 19 <laughs> 53 and all that, and one for the people who actually want to get things done. I was going to say, well, one for the people I mean, to I'm help them with I'm but I do think one of the big problems with Parliament is it is full of lawyers. There's too many lawyers in there. Well, certainly one too many on the opposition bench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> but I do think if it gets through tomorrow, um, regardless of any kind of legal challenges, the pressure from Conservative MPs on the Prime Minister to get a plane in the air, come what may. They think he's already got the power regardless. Mm. That he actually doesn't need to pass this bill. He could have done it anyway. So he has to get that plane in the air. Couldn't wish he just, it. like, you know, commission a private jet and take a few people himself? I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure he's got the Alex, means. Alex, he can't do that because that wouldn't look very good on well, the international we, we know, stage. We know we don't check the passports in and out of London <laughs> City airports. So, you're just you not know. even thinking about the international stage, are you? That's <laughs> I, your trouble. All I think about it harrows me, Kev. <laughs> now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime with the announcement that the BBC will start putting adverts on some of its audio. We're asking... If the BBC is making money from ads, why should we pay for it? Shelley says, if they have adverts and they are not state-funded, they are commercial, so the licence fee needs to go. Fletcher writes, get the adverts on and stop the licence. If the BBC is as good as it thinks it is, then it will thrive or die through market forces. Great text. It's exactly what I think. Simon's got in touch to say, people pay for Sky and they have adverts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and Mark uh, tweeted, even the adverts would be woke. Oh my God! All adverts are woke. <laughs> all adverts are woke. I mean, sometimes you, I just watch a whole yeah. skein of adverts, if that's what a collection of adverts yeah. is called, sometime, and I kind of have to look for the sort of you know, let's say archetypal British family because they're not in a single advert yeah, anymore. They're certainly not in the family Christmas adverts, are they? <laughs> not but, at uh, all. Let's move on, eh? Well, coming up after the break, Kate Middleton's finally been spotted out and about for the first time since that edited photo triggered a torrent of conspiracy theories surrounding her health. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Kate Middleton has been snapped on an outing to a farm shop in Windsor with Prince William. It's the first footage of the princess since her abdominal surgery in January and could finally squash conspiracy theories surrounding her health. It comes as reports say Kate's former aides are working around the clock to devise a plan for her return to royal duties. I could do it in two minutes. Uh, we're still joined in the studio by Daily Express political editor Sam Lister and the co-deputy leader of Reform UK, Ben Habib, who's kindly agreed to stick around because he, he finds our company so brilliant. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't bring himself we've, to leave. We understood. We've given him a new job, the chairman of Rwanda Watch. <laughs> the chairman <laughs> of Rwanda Watch. <laughs> well, on the account of that, he's staying for another half hour. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the, the palace aides are now working round the clock to find out how to return her to royal duties. I keep saying, look, we Do saw that video. footage of her going to the farm shop. By the way, I think they were buying bread. Uh, uh, William and Kate. Uh, so nice pictures. There she is, chatting, smiling. Ha ha ha! And so the palace go. Oh well, this will begin to diffuse all these conspiracy theories. Did it hell? I mean, immediately in America, very high. Uh, profile luminaries and uh, celebrities were saying, that's not her. That's not... I heard people in the office this morning, that's not her. Do you know, I have to say, that's what I thought. Yeah, well, I don't you start, Ben. <laughs> well, let, let's take it... Look, it's, it's, our sister, it's our sister newspaper. It's a brilliant scoop by the sun. And, it, it, you know, it's definitely him, and so I'm going to take it that it is her. So they go, oh, well, this will help to diffuse some of this uh, wild speculation. So here's what I... Just, look, she's well enough to talk, to go to the... Mm. Stick her in a chair with William next to her, put a camera on them, two minutes. Listen, uh, I'm absolutely fine. As I said, when I went off for abdominal surgery back in the beginning of Jan January, I'll be back after Easter. Everything's cool. Let's go. Forget all this stuff. That will kill it stone dead. Why don't they do that? I don't know. I feel like she's been really badly let down. Yes, by she the, has. By I, the agree. Operation. Yeah. I think they're not equipped to deal with they're the modern not. media yeah. age. They don't fundamentally do not understand social media. Mm -hmm. They are operating yes. in an analog age and they have lost control of this story completely. 
And I think it was very unfortunate that Kate had to take the hit for the doctoring of the photo. I mean, how many people really think she sat there photoshopping photos in an evening? I don't, I don't think it really washed that well. Mm. And I, I think people felt very sorry for her. I mean, I think generally sympathy is massively, massively with her and people do want her to be left alone. But you have to get a grip of this story. You have to um, take some control. And I think this um, visit to the farm shop didn't do anything to alleviate all the conspiracy theories about well, Kate. Arguably, arguably, the visit to a farm shop was them going to a farm shop and it was a member of the public who happened to film that. And, you know, why should they take notice of social media? I don't. The mainstream media largely are being relatively, in this country anyway, being relatively decent about their approach to it. She said she's had abdominal surgery, it's scheduled and she won't be back after Easter. She's, she, she deserves some medical privacy, right? I really would Absolutely. stand up for that. I yeah. think the way all this speculation, she must tell us exactly what she's had. No, leave her alone. I think that's, that's totally, I completely yeah, can agree with you. Can I have my money you. back, my taxpayer, that pays for the royalty? <laughs> they back. make Is more money right? for you than well, you no, pay Can I have them? my money back that pays for them? Then they don't have to tell me anything. How about that? But I, can, yeah. I completely agree. She really did de de deserve privacy. And I yeah. think everybody agreed with that until A degree the point, of privacy. until the point when the photo was released and that photo was doctored. Mm. And that then set off a, a thousand hairs racing mm. which they have failed to yeah. control. Well, ben, but, ben, ben, you'll, yeah. you'll you know, have a lot of knowledge of this uh, due to your political uh, work. Uh, these days, all organisations, be it the royal family, a political party, a commercial company, you need really good people in your communications department because uh, communications, the media, are a hell of a lot more complicated than they used to be. And frankly, uh, my theory about the Kensington Palace comms team is they're a bunch of useless, chinless wonders who are way too deferential. Yes, sir, no, sir, free bag full, as opposed to, no, Kate, don't edit that picture. <laughs> they share them with Rishi Sunak and yeah, well, CCHQ. Maybe, maybe yeah, yeah. could be, but, but, I mean, you need... You well, need... I mean, I completely agree. They should have a, a, an absolutely slick PR machine that is across all forms of media, traditional, linear, analogue, social, you know, you name it, they should, they should nail it. But what I don't really understand, Sam, perhaps you can shed some light on this, is why she had to take the hit on the doctoring of the photo. Why didn't she just say it was doctored mm. by the team and uh, for whatever reason, tell the truth, right? Mm. I mean, why should she take that hit? And clearly she didn't doctor yeah. the photo. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all I can say is thank goodness she is back, assuming that was her that we yeah. saw. <laughs> 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 Let's start that. Well, if, and, I, um, if I was her husband, I'd take the rap. I'd say well, it was exactly. Me. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I think that would have been that's what a that would, would have been do, chivalrous, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Now uh, let's move back to politics because uh, it's revealed today the the one thing that's going to make Rishi Sunak lose the election, the one thing, uh, is if uh, he doesn't put up Tory defence spending, and we all know that that is uh, not the thing that's going to make him lose the election, but a very critical talking point. One veteran Conservative MP said if Rishi won't open the purse strings for national security, Penny Mordaunt would. But, I mean, uh, Ben, let's, let's get back to you first on this, because we were talking about defending yeah. the country and turning boats around and so on and so forth. We do live in an era now of attritional warfare. It's not all cyber. It's not all, you know, GCHQ. We need guns, we need tanks, and Absolutely. we need boots on the ground. Absolutely. I remember uh, when we were developing the typhoon, do you remember, the, when it was in a development phase, people were saying, this is a complete waste of money, we don't need another jet like this, next war is not going to be fought in aerial combat, and actually, thank goodness we've got the typhoon. Um, no, one of the worst political expressions ever coined is the peace dividend. And the notion that you can have a dividend because you're at peace is the hijacking of economic contribution to defence, which is vital, because no country, particularly our country, which has a history of foreign interventions, um, is ever at peace for more than a few years at most. You're either at war or you're about to go to war, and you better be ready for it. And, you know, one of the biggest concerns I have about Ukraine is not what's happening in Ukraine, but the signals that we're giving off in the West about how weak and insipid we are, an inability to control illegal migration to the country and a complete failure to arm ourselves up. The entire British military force would sit in, yeah. in fewer seats than there are in Wembley. You know, that's an unacceptable position for the United Kingdom to have got to. And there is not a single country in Europe, with the exception of the UK and Greece, believe it or not, that meet their 
NATO target of 2% of yeah. GDP. Yeah. When mm. We're at 2.2% in the 1950s. We used to spend 7% yeah. of our yeah. GDP yeah. on defence. And this is a well-known syndrome. The further countries get from war, the less they spend. Uh, uh, mm. But uh, the Romans said... Uh, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, no, there can be no more acute time in history than right now. And uh, what did you think, or both of you think, about uh, Jeremy Hunt's uh, extraordinary budget a couple of weeks ago where he never even mentioned defence? It's not good enough, is it? I think it, it was a surprise that he didn't mention defence because he had been lobbied intensively to spend more money on defence. And we know, you know, going back some years... I think mistakes have been made in the past. There have been various defence and strategic reviews that thought, uh, as Alex was mentioning, that everything would be going in the cyber direction. And so we, we switched focus. And actually, Russia has just gone old school mm. and, and we, were, we were thinking it would be advanced, it would be cyber warfare. It, it, they've gone old school and we mm, were yeah. not ready for that. As Boris Johnson said, you will never see tanks rolling over the ground in yeah. uh, a conflict in Europe again, yeah, really? shortly before yeah, the yeah. Ukraine that war. Lot of Thanks good. again, Boris. Yeah. That lot of good a strategic virus would do when you've got a <laughs> platoon bearing down <laughs> on you. <Right. laughs> yeah, Hit would. them with a strategic virus. <laughs> <laughs> That'll show them. Exactly. Now, talking, talking, uh, staying on the subject, if you will, of money for defence, former President Donald Trump can't find an insurance company to underwrite his bonds to cover the massive judgment against him. Uh, this is the New York Attorney General's civil fraud case against him. The bond is something like, is it sort of half a Four, billion? 464 something. billion. Yeah. A wow. million dollars. Almost wow. half a, yeah, it's a huge, million quid. Hu huge amount of money and he can't find anybody to, to raise that capital. Well, it's probably bad risk, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be, though. It shouldn't no, it be shouldn't because, be. Yeah. Because he borrowed all this money mainly from Deutsche Bank. Uh, and they say, well, you borrowed it on fraudulent uh, on a fraudulent basis because you exaggerated your wealth. He borrowed all that money and paid it all back. Yeah. So what is this case yeah. all There's about? There's no damage to anyone. Exactly. In the United Kingdom, there'd be no case. But in America, they have, you know, peculiar laws. They're much yeah. more litigious it's lawful. than we are. This is lawful. Yeah. Mm. There's, this is a Democrats uh, declaring law on I mean, uh, Trump. Would Simple you, Sam, Sam, I'm going to ask Sam first thing, then ask you the same question, Ben. Uh, do you welcome Trump back in the White House? Do you think that's going to make the West and the world more secure or more insecure? Well, I think the, the, the question mark is over his approach to Russia, isn't it? Mm. And I think, as a nation, we would uh, feel very uneasy with his position as it, as it stands towards Russia. And I think um, whatever, whatever complexion of government we have, whether it is Labour, Tory or a, a kind of hung parliament, a coalition, a ragtag coalition, they will have to deal with Trump if he wins that election. Mm. So we, we have to deal with the here and now. But I think that... that approach to Ukraine and Russia is going to be a huge point of conflict if he does not um, see things the way we do. Don't you think, yeah. Ben, that I, I suspect Trump will be like his last presidency, all uh, earth, wind and fire coming in, oh, you're going to see... And then when he became the president, he was actually quite moderate. Uh, didn't do anything particularly extreme. It wasn't a massively successful presidency, but it certainly was not a failure. Uh, so uh, Trump, uh, the rhetoric doesn't often match the actions. No, and I, I mean, I, I'm glad, for one, that he's calling out Europe on its failure to meet its NATO commitments. Yes, yeah. I agree. Um, it's absolutely right that he should do so. And he did the same in the last yeah. Trump presidency, but not for a second in the last Trump presidency did he diminish America's contribution mm. to our defence in Europe, even though he threatened us... Uh, in my view, rightly, he didn't do it. And the other thing I'd say about Trump, and I might disagree with you slightly here, Sam, because on the whole, we completely agree, but I think it's wrong to be giving Zelensky a blank cheque from the West to get on and defend his country the way he wishes to defend it. If we are spending the kinds of money, the sort of money we are spending, $5 billion, uh, you know, from the UK, $150 billion so far from the US, there should be a clear geopolitical aim established for the United States and for the United yeah. Kingdom. We need to tell Zelensky how we wish this thing to end yeah. up. And I think we're in real danger in Ukraine of a resurgent Russia. We talked about defence spending. Russia has increased its defence defense spending eight or ninefold yeah. in the last mm. three years, from something roughly what we were spending on defence to $370 billion a, a year. And they may break out of the Donetsk region and if, and if they break out of that region and they're in a resurgent Russia, there will be no deals to be done with Russia. Yeah. They will come straight to the Polish border. And in the pursuit 
of a total defeat of Russia, what we would have done is actually bring them much closer to Western Europe. And I think we need to think much more cleverly about what we're doing in Ukraine and the way we fund it and, the, and that war effort, including as we started this discussion uh, about, you know, arming ourselves up, making sure we're ready mm -hmm. for war. And the Russians, uh, you know, it's their old tactic, their old strategy is they just plow on yeah. with numbers and numbers and numbers. Absolutely. They take the most enormous amounts of They won World War II, we didn't. And they tend to win. And uh, actually, uh, they're on the front foot in that yeah. conflict right now. So it'll be very interesting if Donald gets in. My prediction is, uh, contrary to his rhetoric, he will not stop funding Ukraine. I don't, don't yeah. think we can. No, I, I uh, kind of agree with yeah, that. To go back to our main, uh, well, not our main story, one of our main stories, we have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime with the announcement that the BBC will start putting adverts on some of its audio. We're asking, if the BBC starts making money from ads, why should we pay for it? Ben writes, no. If they are going down the paid advertising route, then no one should pay. Rose has tweeted, I cancelled my licence years ago and others need to do the same. Alison says the BBC needs to come out of the dark ages and be subscription only. There's hardly anything on there that's worth the TV licence fee. Get rid. And Lawrence says the BBC make films, which I assume make money, and BBC Studios runs Dave, which shows adverts and makes money. There should be no need to pay for a TV licence. Why are we paying twice? Now, coming up after the break, with roads at breaking point and drivers facing increased fines, are motorists in Britain suffering more now than ever? Yes, they are. <laughs> I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, with roads at breaking point throughout the UK, a new report has revealed that pothole repairs are at an eight-year high. But is this enough to save our streets? Oh, it's mad, isn't it? Ministers have once again highlighted their pledge to provide an extra £8.3 billion pounds worth of funding for road improvements. But is this money actually coming from road users themselves? Well, it's been revealed that more than half of drivers face being fined by councils under a new wall on motorists. We're still, of course, joined by political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and co-deputy leader of Reform UK, Ben Habib. Um, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Anyone who owns a car in this country knows that there's almost no point owning a car in this country because you're either going to, like, the wheel's going to fall off from a pothole, you're going to be fined for doing 22 and a 20 mile per hour, which is almost impossible to detect yeah. or control, or you get stuck in a whole queue of traffic, find yourself in a yellow box and be paying anything northwards of 60 quid. And this is, you know, there is a war on the motorists. We've seen that in London. Uh, if, if you end up with the Labour government, I think you can draw conclusions from the way Sadiq Khan has run this city. Uh, and it's clear, you know, LTNs, the uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, which are good for the people that live in them, but terrible for everybody else around them. Uh, 20 mile an hour zones. Which it's not that possible. great for people who live in them because they can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that, there is that, although it does make it a little bit kind of more pedestrian friendly, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, 20 mile an hour zones that nobody can possibly keep to. The first time I ever went out driving and encountered one of these, I thought I was stuck behind a drunk driver because they were driving so erratically. <laughs> but it turns out it's because they were driving it's at 20 miles an hour. It's because you spend more time is. staring at your speedo yeah. than you do concentrating yeah. on the road. And it bizarre. brings out various inclinations in me between homicide and suicide. <laughs> <laughs> I want to kill the guy in front of me or put myself out of my misery. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was driving around London on Saturday. I mean, it was one of those days where they'd put up a few roadblocks for this, that and the other. I mean, it was pretty much impossible. You go to places like Islington, they are unnavigable now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are places that I wouldn't... I don't even think of going to, let alone living in, yeah. that have become just yeah. a no-go area for motorists. This war on motorists is getting bizarre. Uh, not only uh, do they make it impossible for us to drive around, they don't bother to repair the roads. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what well, what's going interesting, on? actually, is that the thing that's causing most of the damage of these roads, that's really sort of, you know, afflicting an assault on asphalt, is uh, electric vehicles, because they're so blimmin' heavy. They're so heavy. And the damage, of course, is to all cars, but motorcyclists, and ironically, cyclists are most in danger mm. from potholes. Mm. So all those would be environmentally friendly, save the planet, where they grow pro to make sure that all cars behave. <laughs> I wondered properly. what that happened. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what's you were doing then, Ben? <laughs> it was a GoPro. It was, GoPro. It, was an, it was an entirely innocent <laughs> gesticulation. Um, you know, so cyclists, those do-gooders, they're the ones who are most put in harm's way by the potholes. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm tempted to sort of say I'm very much against potholes. I don't like them at all. But if cyclists fall into them... <laughs> I don't know. That's a joke, folks. I promise you that is just I think, I think a joke. The twin narrative of knife crime on the up in London and 20, 20 mile per hour low traffic neighbours just means carjackings around the corner. <laughs> uh, That's let's, what talk about, to look uh, to. let's talk about uh, Welsh Labour gender in schools. Basically, no. a survey of schools, these parents, the concerned parents, have done an FOI, a Freedom of Information request. And they've uh, discovered uh, that the majority of schools uh, allow kids to change gender, uh, many of them without telling parents. Uh, this is under Kim Jung Drakeford's uh, ongoing premise, <laughs> premiership, which is about to end, lucky for the people of Wales. But this is classic of Wales, isn't it? That, that This is kids going to their teacher and saying, don't tell my mum and dad, but I want to be a girl. And the teacher's going, OK, you can be a girl while you're at school. That's outrageous. Yeah, and use the girls loose. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. If these kids really want to do this, if they are genuinely suffering from gender dysphoria, then the parents have to know, surely. Well, I think that the bottom line is, if you, if you are a child, say, say you're an eight-year-old child, do you really understand the concepts involved here? No, you don't. So your parent must be consulted. And what they are doing is subverting the uh, parental role, uh, saying we know best, and allowing children to, to say they are the opposite gender, as Alex points out, then that gives you rights to use certain loos, but not just loos, changing rooms, school trips, for example. Uh, this has knock, knock on, huge knock-on implications for other 
um, pupils. Many girls now are afraid to go to mm. the loo. They, they feel right. intimidated. Mm -hmm. They are apparently not drinking in the day because they don't want to use the loos. They're going home to use the loos and bunking off school if they're on their periods or it's... I remember this when I was um, working in Wales and I've just got it here. It was actually a, a, a school in Wales who were the first to bring in unisex toilets. There's a huge backlash because the girls yeah. said, we're just not going to use them. Girls feel uncomfortable in those scenarios. I, can I just say, why boys feel separate. uncomfortable too. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel very Absolutely. uncomfortable going into a yeah. mix. Loom, yeah. yeah, I don't think anybody thinks. Well, most people do not enjoy that mixed no. se yeah. setting in yeah. the well, I think, you know, most really, intimate areas of your life. Talking you about know? teens, it's almost a form of child abuse. Yeah. Frankly, yeah. it's quite disturbing. Tell the mums and dads it's outrageous. Yeah. This is about who brings up children. Is it the state it or is, is it parents? Yeah. But I don't want it to be the state. It's End progressively, up. progressively more and more the state. Yeah, yeah. I know. The state is That's getting its point. tentacle. And when Jeremy Hunt gets up and says so proudly, I'm going to extend child care to mothers who've got babies of nine months old. That's basically inciting the breakdown of the nuclear family when a child is only nine months old. That's mm, what they're absolutely. doing. Very quickly before we go to break, uh, uh, British actor Aaron Taylor Johnson, uh, it says, has formally been offered the job as the new James Bond. I thought it was going to be Ben. Uh, thoughts, uh, Sam? <laughs> well, until, until the story broke last night, I'd never, literally never heard no. of it. So maybe, maybe that's just a fraction of my age. But yeah. um, he, oh, I don't know. He I'm was sure he's the, a great actor, but... Uh, he, he's well, in, it was in The Avengers, which makes me start thinking of, uh, what's it, Pat's Steed and uh, yeah, Peel. Uh, Emma and, and, yeah. the, the, most and all that. the most fascinating facet of this handsome man who's the next uh, Bond, apparently, is that his wife is uh, a lot older than him. He's Sam Taylor would be a uh, famous modern yeah. artist. It's a bit so of a Macron scenario. There's yeah. a lot of ha yeah. money going into that household. <laughs> 007, nice. Who was your favourite Bond? Uh, I think probably... I'm, I'm torn between Connery and uh, um, Roger Moore, but probably Roger Moore because he was funnier. Yeah. Roger Moore, I'm afraid. Yeah. Sam? <laughs> well, I've only seen one Bond film. <laughs> You've only seen one Bond film? <laughs> What's that? Which one? Uh, it was one of the Daniel Craig ones. Oh, my, not even so Daniel Bond. Craig is your favourite. Skyfall, Not even yeah. a proper Bond. Skyfall is very good. How have British. you gone through life not having seen know. a Bond film? I don't know. I don't know. Really I don't know. 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 I don't <laughs> right, thank you ever thank you so very much, much, Sam and, and Ben. Uh, ben, thank you so much. Great hour. Now, coming up after the break, the Rwanda stalemate continues as MPs last night rejected all the amendments put forward by peers. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that was oh, one. a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was move on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are with you. Live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, Rishi Sunak's policy of sending migrants to Rwanda faces further delays as Labour vow to oppose the plans in a crucial vote tomorrow. They claim each deportation will cost as much as sending six people into space. Meanwhile, Princess Kate has been seen on video for the first time this year, but it's still not enough to satisfy the royal conspiracy theorists. And is it double O heaven for James Bond fans as Aaron Taylor Johnson looks set to be the latest on the screen incarnation of Ian Fleming's hero? All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Elliot Cock. Good afternoon. Downing Street is urging peers to work with the government as the Rwanda bill returns to the Lords tomorrow. The controversial bill suffered a setback after all ten amendments, which included allowing courts to question Rwanda's safety, were overturned. Conservative peer Lord Hayward told Talk TV the Lords will have to compromise. It is likely that um, the Lords will restate their position. But ultimately, however many times the ping pong occurs, um, it, the view is, quite rightly, that the elected House has the final say and therefore the Lords will concede in some form or another. Israel has agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss its planned RAFA operation after the US president warned that going ahead with it would be a mistake. Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone on Monday as tensions between the two countries grow over the war in Gaza. It comes after the White House said Israel had killed Hamas's third most senior leader in an attack on an underground compound last week. The first person in England to be convicted of cyber flashing has been jailed. Registered sex offender Nicholas Hawkes from Essex sent unsolicited nude pictures to a 15-year-old girl and a woman. The woman took screenshots of the WhatsApp image and sent them to police. Cyber flashing became an offence in England at the end of January. Hawkes has been sentenced to 16 months in prison. High Street brand Ted Baker is at risk after its owner said it planned to call in the administrators. According to reports, hundreds of jobs could be on the line with possible store closures. And a smiling Princess of Wales has been seen in video footage for the first time since her abdominal surgery, following weeks of speculation about her health. The Sun has published a clip of Kate out with Prince William in Windsor at a farm shop over the weekend. The couple have faced weeks of social media rumours following the photo editing row. She's not carried out public duties since Christmas. And finally, there is speculation over who could be the next James Bond. The Sun is reporting that Kickass and Marvel Films actor Aaron Taylor Johnson has been formally offered the role, which was last played by Daniel Craig. The next Bond film will be the 26th, following No Time to Die. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello, plenty of fine and dry weather out there for this afternoon and it's still feeling mild as well, but it's not bone dry. As you can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture, we have seen some showers passing through eastwards, but they are mostly tending to disappear across parts of Scotland. However, over areas of the Midlands, the West Country and some eastern parts of England, there may be some heavy and thundery showers this afternoon. And before the day is out, there will be rain arriving across parts of Devon and Cornwall. But as I said, it's mild for the time of year. Temperatures a little above average, up to 50 or 16 degrees Celsius. Overnight, that rain across Devon and Cornwall will steadily move its way north and eastwards. Another pulse of rain also across Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, there will be some heavy downpours across parts of England and Wales, particularly across the high ground of Wales and later in the night over areas of the Pennines. There will also be some showery rain for eastern parts of Scotland. So pretty wet, but there will be dry conditions in the far southwest and the far northwest as well. Now, through tomorrow, that rain continues across parts of northern England, the north and west of Wales, eastern parts of Scotland as well. Still some heavy downpours likely, but it does ease through the day. Either side of that, it will be mostly fine and dry with sunshine in the north where it will be cool but mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the latest controversy for the BBC, which sees the corporation contemplating the use of adverts on its podcasts and on-demand radio shows when they are streamed on third-party services such as Spotify. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, we have been asking you. We're just going to get straight to it. We want to hear what you say think uh so we've been asking you if the bbc starts making money from adverts why should we pay for it uh give us a call let us know what you think on 0344 499 1000 or you can text us don't forget to write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222 or you can tweet us on x at talk tv and indeed we have been receiving lots of your texts and tweets coming in on this topic uh lee has tweeted channels i watch earn their own money, as I'm sure the BBC do. But most channels I watch don't threaten people for watching without paying. I don't endorse the BBC's bullying tactics. Uh, Elizabeth says they should cut the BBC's government funding by 80%. The BBC is useless. Well, David writes, surely the Parliament channel is worthy of the BBC licence fee on its own. I find PMQ's the best comedy show, the BBC broadcasts. Ha-ha, <laughs> very true. That up against and, very, uh, not very <laughs> stiff opposition. They haven't got well, any comedies on yeah, the BBC. That's actually very true as well. <laughs> Barry asks, when can we look at alternatives to funding the BBC and the NHS? Never, because that's sacrilegious and that is like murdering the sacred cow. How dare you, Barry? How dare you call those beloved institutions into question? Good for you, Barry. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now uh, to our top story, and the government has held firm in its standoff with the House of Lords as MPs last night rejected 10 amendments made by peers to the Rwanda deportation bill, and the stalemate is not expected to break soon. The bill will now return to the Lords on Wednesday, where it is expected Labour peers will try to restore their proposed changes, which aim to water down the legislation. Well, Labour has also vowed to oppose the government's plans in Wednesday's vote, claiming each deportation will cost as much as sending six people to space. Well, the delays mean the bill may not become law until after the Easter break now, threatening Sunak's hopes of getting flights off the ground before June. Uh, joining us now is uh, former military uh, intelligence officer Philip Ingram. Uh, thanks for coming on board, uh, Philip. Uh, Good afternoon, folks. I mean, we're, we're stuck in this parliamentary game of ping pong at the moment. Uh, but uh, do you expect that at the end of all this governmental uh, foreplay uh, that we will actually get to a point where Rishi Sunak will actually send at least one migrant, maybe more, to Kigali, to Rwanda, to East Africa? Or do you think uh, this kind of uh, high school debate will just carry on and we'll never get a plane off the ground? Well, it's it's not even a high school debate. It's playground tactics that is going on at the moment. You know, the 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 whole bill is a political football where everyone sees it as an opportunity to give it a good kicking and give the government a good kicking and, and dealing with it. And the government, instead of whenever Rishi Sunak came in, coming up with a slightly different or amended plan, um, you know, is 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 continuing to to stand their ground. They've got the ability to stand their ground. So I think eventually they will get some people off to Kigali. 
Um, but it's not going to be the numbers and it's not going to be the deterrent that they were hoping for. And it's instead of um, improving the government's lot by allowing them to keep a, a, a promise, it's making them look embarrassing. And you know, the, um, the, the those that are coming to the country illegally are laughing their way across the channel. Uh, one thing I want to talk to you about, which is something we've spoken about off camera before, and I know that you share my concerns about this, is the element of what's going on in terms of the mass migration into the West and uh, security. And ask you quite directly whether or not, by not stopping these boats crossing the channel, we could be importing sleeping terrorist cells, criminality, at the very least, socially and economic disruption. And in doing so, we'd be essentially directly funding terror organisations, international crime syndicates, and enabling horrible, you know, state-run mercenaries like the Wagner regime, who are behind a lot of this stuff. Uh, simply yes to all of that. You know, the, um, the, the, the terrorists are um, getting people into the country. Um, they are putting sleeper cells in. Their criminal networks um, have abused this. The, the, the Albanians were a, a big set that did that, and the government seems to have fixed the Albanian problem. But there are other criminal networks that are infiltrating people in. Um, this is being, um, in many ways, pushed through um, hostile state activity. And you mentioned Wagner, you know, Russia, China, Iran. They're all behind the, a lot of the criminal gangs that are uh, pushing people up through Europe because they can see the destabilizing effect it has. Um, and that's playing into their hands enormously. And the more that we debate this, the more it goes around uh, the, the, um, the, the House of Parliament, the House of Lords, and then in through the courts, the more they will see that it is tying us up in political knots and legal knots and costing us a fortune, the more the hostile states will, will continue to do it. Um, you, the, the, the government has to come up with a way of stopping this. We need to deter the criminal gangs and people from coming across. But there are other ways, I think, of doing it um, uh, in, a, in a much more logical way. And to add insult to injury now, Philip, uh, we're hearing that Paul Kigali, the Rwandan president, has asked for at least a couple of months delay because he's not quite ready to accept these migrants. Uh, didn't anyone tell him about the uh, Rwanda scheme or anything? I mean, what is going on there in your view? Well, you're, you're, we're dealing we're dealing into Africa, and Africa has got a different way of approaching things. So you know, they create a problem, and all of a sudden, another suitcase of money appears, and the problem goes away. It wouldn't surprise me if that is the tactic that he's using. Um, I've seen it with other things. Now, going back, you hinted that uh, you think there's a far more logical way of dealing with this problem, especially if it suddenly becomes an issue of national security, which I would argue till the cows come home, it is and always has been, and is for most of Europe and America, in fact. Uh, what do you think should be done? I think there should be a, a legal route for um, people that are seeking asylum um, to put their application in somewhere in the continent. And then all of these people that are coming across the channel, if they haven't gone through that and got their paperwork signed and stamped and all the rest of it, um, they're just chucked straight back across the channel again, um, in the same way that the Germans and the French just chuck people out of their country. Um, and uh, they, all of those are then applying for asylum. If they have got a legal, uh, a legal right for, for asylum in this country, you know, they're going to be stuck in that third party country whilst their application is processed. Um, and if they get refused, they're still stuck across in the continent. So open something, I wouldn't say Calais, I'd say, you know, some, some, somewhere further, further south, but that would then um, make it a French or German or Spanish or Italian problem. And I think it would go away very quickly then. Uh, I mean, Labour are very keen on this idea of a northern French processing centre for asylum seekers. Uh, I mean, I'm not entirely against it, but I think the problem with it is, is that not everybody particularly uh, wants to go through the official process. Uh, and many of these migrants, uh, these wannabe British residents, would just walk straight round the processing centre, go to the beach and hop themselves on board the uh, nearest rubber dinghy. I mean, that is a problem, isn't it? This, this idea that Labour come up with, oh, we can solve it, we'll have a processing centre in northern France, that relies on the fact that every single migrant will go, I must do it by the book. Well, I mean, inherently, uh, by the very nature of what they're doing, they're not doing it by the book. I just think many of them will walk straight past and get on the nearest boat and head for Dover. Oh, I, I, undoubtedly, you'll, you'll get some that are will, will still um, 
follow that route. There's the criminal gangs that are enabling them to do that are making millions out of this. But the one thing that we don't have at the minute is something that fixes people in a spot. Those those genuine people who genuinely want to apply for asylum and all the rest of it. If there was somewhere on the continent to do that, I'm sure they would do that. Uh, and what we then need to do is also combine it with something like the Rwanda plan and Labour are going to have to come up with something like that so that as soon as people who don't go through the legitimate routes come into the country, we don't have this funnying around in um, the courts and everything else. It's straight in an aircraft and off, you're gone. Do we not have a problem as well when it comes to the thresholds for people claiming asylum? Because I agree with you, if someone is genuinely fleeing political persecution, war, all the rest of it, then we've always been a country that says, we build your life here, contribute to society, <coughs> and we're going to offer you genuine refuge. But it seems to me these days, when people do get here, and 75% of applications are just rubber stamped and, and, and they stay, is it's on account of things like, I'm gay, I'm Christian in a Muslim country, I'm poor, my country is unstable. If you're using those as the thresholds, and that, to me, is pretty much 75% of the global south. Well, yeah, and, and you, again, you hit another nail on the head. You know, we've got these um, lefty lawyers who are um, supporting uh, the, the uh, people that are coming in and, and coaching them on how to apply for asylum and the, the tick box exercises that they go through. You know, we've seen um, you know, individuals converting to um, the Christian faith uh, and getting baptised just to get extra points on their asylum form. We need to take all that garbage away from it and you get, get to a point where there is a legal route. That legal route is not um, uh, where it's going to keep people in the UK. They have to do it before they get in. And then if people come in illegally, we just rapidly get rid of them. And we don't have time for the courts or anything else to get involved. The Germans are starting to do that. The French are doing that. They still have to apply exactly the same European human rights legislation that we do um, and everything that we we have. We just seem to have other layers of bureaucracy that allow people to abuse it and, and to stay in the country. Uh, indeed. And, uh, I mean, what kind of time frame would you put on all of this, uh, Philip? When, it, it, since Rishi, as I keep saying, has this kind of deranged neurosis about at least getting one migrant to, to East Africa... Uh, given what's going on in Parliament, when would you think he might be able to get that plane into the air? Well, yeah, you said after Easter. Um, it's going to have to be after Easter. It goes back to the House of Lords. Uh, the House of Lords will do, do what they want to do and propose the same amendments that they put in. It'll come back to the House of Commons. The, the Conservative Party will be whipped to vote against um, any of the amendments that are in there, and it, and it will pass in the House of Commons. Um, it that will then go into a process where you'll get all of these legal firms trying to find some legal loophole to take it back into the courts again. And it's how quick it can get out the other side of the courts. You know, this, this is a never ending process. If the government has got any sense, as soon as it comes through the House of Commons, they will have an aircraft preloaded. And the moment the vote says yes, um, that preloaded aircraft takes off before anyone can get the chance to lodge anything into, into the courts. Yeah. Um, I, if, I hope the government does that. Yeah, what you're talking about there is a kind of level of efficiency that <laughs> I think sense. is almost certainly beyond <laughs> our government. But they've good yeah, thought. They've got yeah, yeah, you've, got, you've got me on that one. To, yeah, got to allow the protesters to lie on the runway first. Come yeah. on. Great to talk to you, Philip. Thank you so much, Philip Ingram. Okay, there. cheers, folks. Now, coming up after the break, footage emerges of Princess Catherine's trip to a local farm shop over the weekend, ending online conspiracies prompted by the edit of the family photo. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we're joined now by our very own Mike Graham to give us a little taster ahead of his show, The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, which, of course, is on tonight on Talk TV. Still says at his brand-new time <laughs> of 8pm. It's not brand-new anymore, but it is 8pm with Mike. Uh, first of all, Mike... Don't you think it's about time uh, that uh, Kate Middleton and maybe William sat down in front of a camera and talked to us about this mess that they find themselves in? Couldn't Kate just say, I appreciate all yeah. your concern. As you saw, I've just been to the farm shop. I'm smiling, I'm beaming, I'm OK. I'll be back in action after Easter. That will get rid of all this conspiracy theory madness. Yeah. How about that? You would think so, although I think they're so far down the rabbit hole now, these conspiracy theories, so I don't think they can do anything. No matter what happens now, yeah. uh, you know, she'll have been replaced by some kind of clone, she'll have been murdered, she'll have been killed off by somebody, you know, months ago. It's all completely insane. But the trouble is, if they play up to it, they've got to play up to all of it, haven't they? You know, if you're going to say, well, we're all, we're all OK going to a farm shop, and she's great, look how quickly she's walking and look at that bag she's carrying. Who knows there's anything in the bag? I don't know what she bought. Bread. But, you know, you're right. bread. She, they should do something. <laughs> if they're going to play up to the conspiracy theory, which I, which I don't think they should be doing anyway, then they should do it right. And and, and you're correct. She's, they, they should give an interview at, at sitting down together, you know, looking normal. Yep. So I've got a new conspiracy for you, a conspiracy within a conspiracy. Oh, yeah. Perhaps the, the, this whole sort of prolongation of everyone, everyone talking about Kate and all the rest of it, is just drowning out Harry and Meghan noise and keeping the world obsessed with the royal family. It keeps them very relevant. Well, it does tell you how, how obsessed the world is with the royal family. I mean, we were saying this last night on my show. I don't think there's any other family that could uh, it's sort of, you know, command this kind of attention around the world. I mean, we get phone calls from all over the world by people who obviously think I've got an inside track into what's going on inside Kensington Palace, ask me what's going on. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And as Piers Morgan said this week, it's worse than when the Queen died. People care more about this than they care about anything. It, mm. it, it, is, it is extraordinary. Uh, but you've got some green issues there coming up tonight yes. on your show. Tell us all about it. Yeah, them. well, I mean, 
I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, the world will not end before eight o'clock tonight, because uh, you might have heard of the World Health Organization. There's now something called the World Meteorological Organization, oh, which yeah. is also run by the United Nations. Right? I've just discovered this. They come out with a report today uh, and they basically issued a red alert, in their words, for the Earth, because apparently we're not doing enough to stop climate change. And this is the first time we've come anywhere close to 1.5 degrees of a, of a centigrade rise. And they're basically saying that everything we've done so far... Uh, is it working? So I'm going to predict that what we should do is stop doing anything at all, continue with what we were doing, and we'll still be in the same place a thousand years from now. Also, I'm going to look at an organisation called the Green Alliance. They've oh, come yeah. out today and said that Rishi Sunak and the government have completely failed the electorate by not doing what they said they would do to stop climate change and get to net zero. And you would not believe the numbers of organisations that give these people money. Incredible. Sussex Water, you know, all sorts of foundations, all kinds of things like the National Trust, pumping millions of pounds into these green lobbying organisations in order to make government policy. It's an absolute racket. You know what I've never understood about all of this? If we keep saying the world's on fire, it's all going horribly wrong, we're going to be facing mass floods, extinction-level events, is going to get super hot, why aren't we doing anything about that bit? Do you know what I mean? Why aren't we building yeah, well, houses on stilts on floodplains? Why aren't we creating sunlight reflective paint on the outside of buildings? Why are we just moaning about coal-fired power stations and not doing the next step? Well, I can tell you why, Alex, because none of it would make any bloody difference. Because the point is, if the Earth is going to decide to blow up and get too hot and kill everybody, then that's what it's going to do. The idea that, you know, pathetic Earthlings are going to stop the eventual fate that Emperor Ming has got for them in the future, you know, it's not going to happen. The end result is we shouldn't be doing absolutely bugger all. Because the whole point of this is it's about people making money. And if you want to start a green company, you'll get all sorts of subsidies from the government. You'll get all sorts of money from these foundations, which are set up by yeah. nutty millionaires in America to keep pumping this ridiculous message out, which is all rubbish, that the earth is getting hotter and we're all dying. I just it's love all the fact problems. that Sorry. you just look at Iceland and that volcano is going off again, isn't it? It's like, well, there's your emissions yeah. for the next yeah. two decades. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and don't get... worry, as long as you drive around in a Tesla, that's not going to have any effect on the planet. I mean, yeah. do me a small favour, you know. And let's, bu let's buy loads and loads of windmills and solar panels from, drumroll, China. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a great <laughs> show, Mike. Uh, we look forward to it. It's the Independent Republic of Mike Graham from hey. 8 until 10 p.m. You, you do, do not, not want, want to miss a second. second. Cheers, mate. Uh, moving on, though, and uh, footage obtained by the Sun newspaper shows Kate Middleton's visit to a local farm shop in Windsor on Saturday. Well, in the video, the princess can be seen alongside William carrying her shopping, looking happy and relaxed. But it seemingly hasn't been enough to satisfy all the royal conspiracy theorists. Of course it hasn't. Well, joining us now is PR and brand consultant Mark Bukowski. And uh, we can also be speaking to Tom Bauer, royal biographer, a bit later. Uh, but uh, starting off with you, Mark, I mean, look, I think anybody watching this from the outside would say, in terms of PR, it's either genius at keeping the world completely focused on Kensington Palace and making our royal family the most sort of famous and talked about in the world, or it's an utter disaster. What's your read? It's the latter, isn't it, Mark? <laughs> Somewhere in the middle, isn't it? I mean, look, um, this, this is a disaster, but from every crisis, there is an opportunity, and the opportunity now is for all family to think about how they deal with the media. I mean, there's a number of factors that roll into one on this, you know. Um, you you try to give a certain amount of information about certain key members of the royal family's health. One of them happens to be the king. The second is the most photographed woman in the world who has been doing all the heavy lifting while all the sort of Harry and Meghan stuff has been taking off. And you take her out of the equation and communicate that she's been ill and people are very empathetic towards that. Um, but you give people a certain amount of information, but people need more. And that's the problem. In the old days, it'll be never explained, never complained. This sort of um, tactile way of trying to deal with the media would have probably sorted things out, but it's not. And of course, you've allowed this enormous vacuum to be filmed, filled by conspiracy theorists. That, who are that's looking it, isn't it, Mark? Though that, that, that I think that both palaces, uh, Buckingham and uh, Kensington, have made a mistake here. Now it's encouraging that they've decided to cut us in on a bit of the information about them. For example, the King 
you know, impressively telling us I'm suffering from cancer. That resulted in a lot of men going to get checked, so uh, good for the king. However, it does mean people will say, well, what kind of cancer? Uh, we're yeah. not told that. <laughs> then, then you've got Wait. you've got Kate. I've had abdominal surgery. You won't hear from me again until Easter. And people go, what kind of abdominal surgery? This dribs and drabs, little bits of information. I suppose it's an improvement, but it is not satisfactory because, as you say... If uh, you only give a part of the information, uh, people will pour their own speculation into the vacuum. Yeah, of course they will. We've seen conspiracy theories surround iconic names, from JFK to Marilyn Monroe to James Dean, you know, to Lord Lucan. We love a conspiracy theory, and that's a trap they've fallen into. Give a little bit of information. They should have dealt with this. And this is because, you know, William is very protective of his family and his wife, and you know, he wants to put this warm arm around it and looking for privacy. You can't have privacy in the royal family. The royal family, it depends on the level of publicity and noise created. And usually it's pomp and ceremony that they thrive from. But, you know, this is this is really made everybody question whether or not they're fit for purpose in terms of the way they deal with the media. It's a slimmed down royal family. And, you know, I have a theory about this. I think why it's become such an enormous story, not just because of sort of uh, the disruption from Harry and Meghan, but there was a little series, a very successful series that went three times around the world, which was The Crown. And many people in different countries around the world actually thought that wasn't fiction. It, it was a documentary, fact. yeah. Exactly. So therefore, they're expecting there to be more here. But they're not telling us. It's all about control. And they should have actually stopped these, these ridiculous rumours at source and to a certain extent. They should have got friends in, in, in places, you know, doing a little bit of messaging to key influencers. If not, they've actually got the lunatics, you know, suggesting all sorts of things, or, you know, which um, falls into the flat earth conspiracy. And even yesterday, this picture that was snapped, they probably did it semi on purpose, knowing there's a thousand um, cameras surrounding that farm shop that it would be captured but of course everybody thinks oh that's not real you know it's definitely a fake they're not wearing wedding rings all this ridiculous hunk of and of course the mere fact that they put out a fake photo or a doctored photo to you know to appease everybody on mother's day made the situation worse so it's time for them to rethink how they deal with social media how they how they communicate in the modern world where the world's rumors are run by unregulated media and not by regulated <laughs> media you have a sensible conversation with but, I mean, do, do they actually have to deal with social media? Because it's a cesspit of madness anyway. They're dealt, they'll dealt, dealt in part with mainstream media. And surely, you know, the problem is you feed the beast and the beast stays hungry. If they say... They've said it's abdominal surgery, so everyone wants to know what type of abdominal surgery. If they give the next detail, people want to know even more gory details. And at the centre of all of this, there is a human who might be in a pretty fragile state, both physically and mentally, from something she's going through as the world's most photographed woman. To absolutely spot on. That is the problem. You take away the one person who's been doing the heavy lifting for the royal family for months and months and months. You do telegraph that she's been. And I think people have a huge amount of sympathy. I don't think people are blaming Kate for any of this nonsense at the moment. But the thing is, they've got to have a modern idea of, of, of actually how... Look, the royal family are brilliant, have proved that they are... they. They, they are excellent at actually brevity. I mean, that statement about, you know, um, opinions may differ that came out after the, the Oprah interview was a genius piece of writing because it, it said so much with so little text. And I think that's where you need to look at it. And it seems to me there's disjointed. There's a media relations side, different palaces. And look, and they're suffering from really some bad negative publicity, you know, with health issues, Prince, Prince Andrew running around, and who steps into the into the into the front there to take the heavy lifting now? You know, there was a lot of noise around, um, you know, to Edward's sort of sixth birthday party. It didn't even touch the sides. Yeah. So there are some hard working roles, yeah, but the they're thing, not. The thing is, Mark. The thing is, Mark. Business. The thing is, Mark. You, you, if I if I say to you, I've hurt myself, you then say to me, Oh, what have you done? I, I'm not telling you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not enough. It's a, it, then you'll go, well, what exactly is wrong? Right? That's what we're going through. Mark, Mark, we've got to go. Great to talk to you as usual. You still owe me that lunch. Uh, that's Ooh, uh, Mark Borkowski. <laughs> yeah, you can. Great. You certainly Thanks can. for the future lunch, Mark. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> now, coming up after the break, adverts on the BBC. Oh, what next? We're looking at our esteemed national broadcasters' unprecedented plans to plug their funding gaps. 
I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. It was, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the BBC is reportedly planning to introduce adverts around its audio output for the very first time in a move that could have massive implications for rival commercial radio stations. Our national broadcaster, funded to the tune of £3.8 billion a year, let's not forget, is apparently working on proposals to introduce adverts on podcasts and radio shows streamed on third-party services like Spotify. Well, joining us now to discuss this is Principal of South College at the most amazing university, Durham, my alma mater, uh, media commentator and former BBC executive Tim Luckhurst. Uh, hi, Tim. I mean, for me, when I first saw this story, I thought, well, the BBC already put adverts. Uh, if you look at their content abroad, they've normally got adverts on the news website. And if you listen to some of their content or watch some of their channels abroad, same thing. And they've been selling the rights to some of their big programmes for a long time. This is sticking adverts on Spotify like anyone else does, surely. Well, um, I tend to take exactly the same view. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing for the BBC want to, to want to do. After all, it's not going to put adverts on its own BBC Sounds app. It's not going to put adverts on live radio. You'll be able to listen to the BBC in exactly the same way if you do so, so through BBC services. But if the BBC is streaming through a commercial service, then it hopes that it'll be able to sell some advertising around its 
programs, non-news programs, I have to add. It's not going to chart, try and put any advertising around news programs. It would just be non-news programs like The Arches or Desert Island Discs. It would like to sell some advertising around that. Now, given that there's a £500 million shortfall in the BBC's funding at the moment because the licence fee has been kept very low and the government has not allowed inflationary increases the last few years, I can understand exactly why the BBC is doing it. Uh, £3.8 billion a year is a lot of money. I've never quite understood. It's a bit like the NHS, oh, we haven't got enough money. But you get £200 billion quid a year. Surely you must be able to work with that. Surely the BBC must be able to work with £3.8 billion a year. I mean, the commercial broadcasters will kill you. They'd chop their right arm off for that. Uh, but if they do start the BBC taking... does an awful lot more than the commercial broadcasters do. Yeah. And, of course, the £3.8 billion you're talking about is, in real terms, a lot less than the BBC would have been expecting to have if the licence fee had increased in line with inflation. So it's not a colossal sum, given the range of services. Well, it is a colossal sum, isn't it, Tim? Uh, but uh, the, the no, purists, I, BBC I agree, purists... BBC purists will say that this is the thin end of the wedge. It'll be like heroin. Once the BBC starts saying, hey, we can make a few quid out of advertising, let's extend it a bit. Let's make some more adverts. And before you know where you are, uh, we'll have adver adverts in the middle of Strictly and the news. And frankly, in my view, why not? Then I don't have to pay 170 quid a year for it. Well, I mean, I think you're making an interesting point there because I suspect the BBC's logic is that most of us won't want to pay £170 a year yeah. for the BBC services in the future, that it expects to have to have a rather smaller licence fee settlement and therefore needs to have ways of providing additional funding to maintain its services. It certainly doesn't want to have advertising on any of its terrestrial digital television stations, on any of its live radio programmes. That would be to completely destroy the BBC's distinctive identity. It would also be, of course, colossally unpopular with commercial competitors because the <laughs> BBC's reach is such that if it were to run advertising on those mainstream services, it would compete very effectively and probably offer low prices, which would undercut the private sector. So no, none of us wants to do that because one of the great things about the UK is we've got great private sector broadcasters as well as the BBC, and that's a good balance. Yeah, good I point, mean, good point. One, one would argue, actually, that the mandate of for receiving the licence fee is upholding absolute impartiality. And yet again, the BBC have done something to upset a great many people like me and people in my cohort. They've had to release a grovelling apology for describing the third biggest political party in the UK now, Reform UK, as far right. I mean, this is another example of, I would say, a sort of campaigning media. That's just wrong, isn't it? Well, it's clearly wrong, and the BBC has apologised for it because it was wrong. But I think that describing it as the BBC describing reform as right-wing would be a little bit unfair. A journalist writing for BBC News Online described reform as far right. There were then perfectly reasonably very strenuous complaints from those who would describe reform as being conservative in some ways, and left wing in some parts of its economic policy, but certainly not far right. And the individual was obliged to correct the copy. So one mistake, probably by a young journalist whose friends think that reform are far right, um, but then young people can have some rather distorted perspectives about politics if they don't follow it closely. And that's now been corrected. So of course, reform is not far right. And of course, it's being corrected and that's quite proper. You've got to watch out for those young journalists and yeah. you have to get old journalists like me. Uh, good to talk thank to you. Thank send, you so send much. Send my love to the University of Durham. I miss it terribly. Do I will do, do so with great glee and thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, <laughs> Tim. Tim. Tim Luckhurst there. Uh, and we do indeed have more of your texts and tweets on this issue coming in about the BBC. Rose writes, something has to fund all the wokeness they produce. <laughs> Bob says, the BBC has no financial problems. Simply <clears throat> shut down all the ludicrous local stations providing the most trivial information on so-called local issues. No, keep the local stations. Shut down the rest local. of it. Yeah. David's tweeted, if the BBC are using adverts, they should scrap the BBC licence fee. And Nigel says, is that you, Nigel? Is that my mate Farage? If the BBC starts showing adverts, it will kill commercial media. Well, that is a very interesting point, isn't it, in terms of the BBC monopoly yeah, uh, when it comes indeed. to uh, other channels competing. Let's return now to the Kate Middleton story as she's been spotted for the first time since her surgery in January. We can now speak to royal biographer Tom Bauer. I mean, Tom, the problem is this has just got to such a farcical point now. Is, is she alive? Was she having an affair? Was William 
having an affair? Is there a love child? Is she actually, I don't know, a taxidermid version of herself on casters being rolled out of that Windsor farm shop? Is it Christmas time? That they've left it so long and the conspiracy's got so big that even this isn't going to silence those who've got their own agenda and their own ideas. Absolutely. This won't silence. It'll just fuel it. I mean, this is the terrible plight they've put themselves into. It was a terrible mistake to go out on a Saturday morning to a very popular farm shop. They had to expect to be filmed there. I think they just uh, now lost the plot. Uh, they just have to sit down with some serious grown-ups and decide what they're going to do to stop the avalanche of speculation and bad publicity. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, Tom, what, what I've been... They, are, they have now steered themselves in through, through a, a kind of combination, a toxic combination of amateurishness and incompetence into an absolute global mess. Uh, and they have to do something about it. Their response so far, Kensington Palace, seems to be, we'll use all our old techniques. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of filter them out and we'll, uh, you know, we'll get a picture of uh, Kate smiling. And then if you go to this event, you might catch her talking to a member of the public. And if you turn your microphones up, you might get some useful stuff that will kill all of this wild speculation about what's wrong with her. My suggestion is this. Because this is unprecedented, this is out of control, it is ridiculous the things that are being said about poor Kate as she recovers from her condition, in, particularly in America, but around the world. My suggestion is this. Unprecedented situation. Stick William and uh, Kate in front of a camera, nice little chat, saying, really, this is ridiculous. I'm absolutely fine. As I told you in the first place, I've had abdominal surgery. I'll be ready at Easter. I'll be back in action. Please stop all this nonsense. That would help, wouldn't it? Why don't they do this? Well, it would help, but it would just probably raise even more questions. I think the real <laughs> problem is they can't decide what they want to do or who they are anymore. Um, to suddenly appear on Saturday like that was really quite foolish. Uh, and I don't know actually who they discuss it with, because it quite clearly, we've discussed this before, quite clearly their advisors are not really up to scratch either. And I don't think anyone is telling them that they've got to be careful, that this just cannot go on like this. And I, like you, I fear... They're going to permanently damage themselves. And that will be a tragedy for Britain and for the monarchy. Uh, something has got to stop and somebody has got to take control because the way they're doing it at the moment is just actually uh, so self-destructive. It's really, really, yeah. really sad situation. I, I just feel very sorry for Kate. I still do. I think we, you know, it's not her fault. It's not Kate's fault. It, it, it's the it's yeah. the hapless uh, advisors around them who really, really do need to raise their game. Tom, uh, as always, excellent to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Now, an increase in defence spending or, in or risk electoral wipeout. That's the warning from a group of Tory MPs who claim the only way to secure a Conservative win in the next election is to put security and defence front and centre. Senior Tories, including Commons leader Penny Mordaunt, uh, touted as a potential replacement for Rishi Sunak, of course, and former Secretary Ben Wallace are leading calls for a boost in spending, putting national security in front and centre of the Your Country needs you election campaign. Well, joining us now is the former Chief of General Staff of the British Army, Lord Richard Dannett. Uh, Lord Dannett, fantastic to have you on the programme. I mean, we've seen, haven't we, ever since the invasion of Ukraine, that everyone woke up and went, wow, attritional warfare, that's still a thing. Perhaps we need to get some weapons and send them to Ukraine and then restock our own weapons uh, while we're at it. And yet, Jeremy Hunt made no mention of this in the budget. I don't think it's going to be the death of the Conservative Party. I think there's death by a thousand cuts already when it comes to that hopeless outfit. But it is a very serious issue. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, and a brutal land war in Europe conducted by an aggressor, um, Putin leading Russia, is a threat that we ought to take very seriously. Um, I know analogies with the 1930s are somewhat overworked at the present moment, but there are very strong analogies to the 1930s when Hitler came to power uh, we chose to appease him, we chose to talk to him, we chose not to rearm, and we were very nearly completely defeated. Our army was defeated in France in May-June 1940, and it was only the Royal Air Force with just enough hurricanes and spitfires that prevented us being uh, defeated as a nation. So these uh, glimpses back to history are really important. And the question is, um, I know there's a lot of pressure on the National Treasury in the round, 
But uh, surely the first duty of government is to make sure that this country is properly protected, its citizens are protected, and that makes a very strong case to lift defence spending from 2.2% of GDP, where it is broadly now, at least through 25 to 3%. And actually, you could make a case for 4%. Uh, and uh, if there's anything positive to come out of this fairly grim situation in terms of the escalating global conflict and, let's face it, the threat of uh, World War III, it is that I think the British public are starting to become very aware of the nature of this crisis. And what we're hearing is that unless Rishi... Uh, gets to grip with, grips with this and then announces a rise in uh, defence spending, people won't vote for him. Now, Jeremy Hunt, two weeks ago, obviously proceeded on the basis, oh, I've got to sort of cut to national insurance and try and sort of give the, give the people as much money as I possibly can, so I don't want to waste any money on tanks and things like that. Well, it turns out that the people actually do want the government to spend money on tanks, military equipment and our defence. Uh, so the government needs to realise that the people uh, want this now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, I'm an independent member of the House of Lords. I don't follow any particular political party. But it's been pointed out to me that a couple of days before the budget speech on the Conservative Home website, uh, there was a story that said that 75% of Conservative voters would prefer to see defence spending increased rather than tax cuts. So um, I'm not sure who he's listening to. I would have thought that at the very least he ought to be listening to Conservative voters. So if that's what they want, that's what they should have. And then in the budget speech, he said, well, we'll raise defence spending to 2.5% when conditions are right. Well, hang on, that's a bit like saying to Mr Putin, oh, hold on, don't attack us yet because conditions aren't <laughs> right and we're not ready. It's a bit like the bowler bowling before the batsman's ready in cricket. It's just not cricket. Yeah. Frankly, if these issues weren't so serious, they'd be funny, but they're very serious. Yeah, I was going to move on to that, actually, because I think there's a very lackadaisical approach right now to international security and thinking, well, Russia just wants Ukraine. Eh, is it really going to affect us? And I wanted to ask you what you think the big risks are to this country. We're talking about China, China's incursion into uh, Taiwan and getting all those assets around the developing world, Iran and their proxies disrupting global trade, are we talking North Korea going tonto, Russia and the games they're playing in Africa, as well as, you know, threatening Eastern and Central European countries? What is it that we uh, you sort of have to be most alive against? Well, you've described a pretty unstable world, that little list, haven't you? Um, those are all concerning issues. But I think to cut to the chase, whereas we might be concerned about tensions between China and the United States over Taiwan, we're quite rightly concerned about what's going on in the wider Middle East and certainly the effect on international shipping, and that has an economic consequence. Um, but actually what should be really concerning us most is the situation in Ukraine and the way that it has consequences for the security of, of Europe. Um, why else would Sweden and Finland at this stage in their history have decided to join NATO? Why else would Poland be now increasing its defence budget to 4% and growing the biggest army in Europe, because they are genuinely worried, sharing a common border with Russia, that if Putin is not faced down in Ukraine, and, and that's another whole discussion topic, then there is a chance that he will flex his muscles elsewhere to drive through Belarus towards Kaliningrad through Lithuania. And that's, that's a real worry. And of course, Lithuania, like the other Baltic countries, are NATO members, and therefore are covered by the collective security of Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. You know, would we go to war for Lithuania? Would America go to war for Lithuania? Well, under treaty, we're obliged to do so. So it's what's going on in Europe that it's most, most important to, to take seriously. But the big issue is that if we ever got into a war, the cost of that would be disastrous. What is less disastrous is increasing what we spend on defence to deter war. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of quick facts from history. In 1935, when Hitler was becoming a threat, we were spending less than 3% of GDP on defence. Yeah. When appeasement had failed and the war broke out in 1939, we shot up to spending 18%. Right. And in 1940, when we were fighting for our very survival, it was 46%. Gosh. That's the disastrous cost of fighting a war. Mm. What we should do is pay the premium, the insurance premium, of 2 or 3 4% on defence now to make sure we deter war and don't get into that awful situation again. Good wise words, well uh, wise words, Lord Dannett. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Lord Richard Dannett there. Now, uh, let's move on. Uh, and uh, James Bond has Ooh. a whole new look. He's going to protect bit of a us kind against of, the Russians. Uh, you know, drastic change here. This time in the form of British actor Aaron 
Taylor Johnson, who, if reports are right, is set to take on the role of the famous spy. Now, I don't recognise him, but you might, because he's been in Marvel film Kick-Ass. Uh, he's hanging up his superhero suit, however, for something rather more sophisticated. The new Bond movie has been delayed because of last year's Hollywood strikes, but production is scheduled to begin soon at Pinewood Ooh. Studios in Buckinghamshire. Well, joining us live is Mark O'Connell, author of Catching Bullets, memoirs of a James Bond fan. Uh, great to have you on the programme, Mark. Um, do you think this, uh, this chap's going to make a good Bond if rumours are to be believed? Is he the sort of person you look at and go, that's right, that's in keeping oh, yeah. with all the Bonds before, that's exactly what we need? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, whilst, as they say in Rome, let's... Let's, you know, the smoke hasn't risen yet from the white chimney, so we're not quite there yet. But Aaron, there's something very right about Aaron Taylor Johnson. Uh, this is a media speculation moment, but and it's got great legs uh, today, it seems. But he is exactly who the next Bond should, could, and might be. I, I think he's a really good call, you know, if the fates allow. You're going to have to cut that hair, right? Because he's got, he oh, needs yeah. shorter yeah, yeah. hair. Yeah, yeah. No, P Pierce Brosnan had long hair when he got the role. I think Roger Moore was a little. Uh, sort of flowing in the locks when he signed up back in the early 70s. So, yeah, I'm not worried about hairs Do, and beards at the moment. I, I get what you mean, because I don't really know this uh, Aaron Geezer, but he looks like <laughs> he seems to fit the bill. He's British through and through. I like that. But also what strikes me is he might have done some big films, but I've not heard of him. He's not a big yes. established actor in his own right. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the previous James Bonds have also <coughs> had that, which allows us to then Ooh. totally personify them as Bond. Well, you say that, but I always think and it's Barbara Broccoli who, when she first saw, I believe it was Elizabeth, the costume drama starring Kate Blanchett in the late 90s, she saw Daniel Craig in a minor role and she said he walked across screen like a movie star who didn't know he was a movie star. So actually, I think Aaron Taylor Johnson, you're saying, I don't know who he is, but you've seen his films. He was, you know, he's done The Kingsman. He was in Bullet Train, which is a really punchy, aggressive, but also very brilliant film and a great sort of audition tape for the Bond role. Um, so actually, he's again, he's perfect because he's not obvious. He's not on everyone's lips. And I, I've always said that the next Bond will be someone that will go, oh, yeah, I know him, or I think I've seen him. Yeah. And, you know, we do need someone new. We don't want another Daniel Craig alike or a Roger Moore or a Pierce Brosnan alike. You know, we've got to decide who, where is the movie heroism? Where is... You know, how is Bond going to become Ken in this Barbie movie era world? Yeah. OK, then uh, it's, it's time for the big question. The big one. Uh, uh, who's your favourite Bond? <laughs> My favourite Bond is Roger Moore, always will be. But I think the best was Daniel Craig. And that's controversial. I know the Sean Connery guy, he had a little go at the role as well. <laughs> but um, I think Daniel Craig was good. Again, I remember once Barbara Broccoli, the producer, saying the best Bond should be who we have now. Mm. So obviously right. we don't have Daniel Craig now, but I, I just think I want the next Bond to be the best one. Yeah. Do you know, I've always been team Sean Connery for the simple fact alone that my favourite Bond film is You Only Live Twice because it's got that cool mm. volcano with the rolling away roof. And yeah, good call. The, Spaceships eating others in space. It's got all the good stuff. And uh, we mm. don't want any of that nonsense about James Bond uh, changing sex, do we? We don't want a no. female James Bond, right? No, as Barbara Brocky again, the producer said once, it would be a great disservice to women just to swap Bond's gender. And um, I think women have far more to do in Bond's world than his story world than perhaps being Bond. I think they mm. can make more of an impact alongside him, as they've always done. You know, the Bond films going back to Connery did not always put women on a slightly dumb yeah. blonde pedestal. Yeah. They, they, you know, these women were, were high punching, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, um, villains uh, and uh, And they will be women. in the future, Mark. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Mark, we're going to go, but great to talk Thanks, to you. Mark, Mark O'Connor, author of Catching Bullets Shaken Memoirs. I'm a Bond stirred. fan there. Sadly, though, Alex, we have come to the end of this show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time for tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Up next, there was Ian Collins. Till half from us. Be on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. 
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 <laughs> 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning. 